As we feed our body with its daily nourishment, let us not forget that more importantly, we must feed our souls with the Word of God, the food for our souls. Be a part of spreading the good news and nourishing others. Subscribe, like, share, and tap the notification bell in order to be updated every time we have a new reflection for you. Come, let us partake of the food for our souls. My dear brothers and sisters, we are in the second Sunday of Lent. And once again, I invite you to join me in reading, reflecting, and praying over the gospel this Sunday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He hardly knew what to say. They were so terrified. Then a cloud came, casting a shadow over them. From the cloud came a voice, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus alone with them. As they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them not to relate what they had seen to anyone, except when the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. The Gospel of the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, we are in the second Sunday of Lent. And of course, we know that the Lenten season is the time of the year when we reflect on the passion and death of the Lord. And our Gospel this Sunday is taken from the Gospel of St. Mark. We are in chapter 9, verses 2 to 10. And it is about the transfiguration of the Lord. That's why if we are very observant, you might say, it's a little off today, or rather, it's very inappropriate that we are in the Lenten season, the time we are reflecting on the passion and death of the Lord, and all of a sudden, our Gospel this Sunday is about the transfiguration. Why did I say a little inappropriate? Because, of course, when we talk of the transfiguration of the Lord, we can consider it as an as a glorious event in the life of Jesus. So again, Lenten season, the time to reflect on the passion and death of the Lord, and the transfiguration is a glorious event. They seem not to go together. But the truth, my dear brothers and sisters, every time it is the second Sunday of Lent, the gospel will always be about the transfiguration of the Lord. We only change in the versions. Last year, the version that we read is the version of St. Matthew. This year, we are reading it from the version of St. Mark. And next year, it will be the version of St. Luke. And then next, next year, we go back again to the Gospel of St. Matthew. That's why we say, since every second Sunday of Lent, the Gospel is always about the transfiguration of the Lord, it is therefore intentional that the Church chose this story for the season of Lent. Therefore, we ask ourselves, why would the church have the transfiguration of the Lord on the second Sunday of Lent? Well, my dear brothers and sisters, the reason to that or the answer to that question is also found in the very context of the story about the transfiguration of the Lord. And what is the context? You know, if you go to the Gospel of St. Mark, we are in chapter 9, we are just in verse 2, you go at the end of chapter 8, that's the time when Jesus asked his disciples, remember he asked them the question, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And their answer is, some say you are John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah. And Jesus said, how about you? Who do you say that I am? 
And who answered? Of course, Peter. And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. In short, Peter recognized Jesus to be the Messiah, to be the Christ. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, remember that their concept during the time of the Messiah, the concept, that what they are expecting, the kind of Messiah who would be coming, is a powerful king, as I always say, somebody who would defend them from all of their enemies. Allow me to even say, somebody who would kill all of their enemies. Now, when Peter, of course, said, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, therefore, what, what were they expecting of Jesus? If they recognized, if Peter recognized him to be the Messiah, that he would be a powerful king. Unfortunately, if you go again to the Gospel of St. Mark, after Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus tells them, the Son of Man must suffer greatly and die and on the third day be, rise again. Now, you can just imagine the reaction of the disciples during that time. After Peter recognized Jesus to be the Messiah, they expect him to be a powerful king. And all of a sudden, he says, I am going to suffer and to die? It must have been shocking for them, disappointing. Perhaps they were so depressed listening to Jesus say that. In fact, remember Peter even objected and said, No, you cannot die. And yet Jesus, remember, called him, get behind me, Satan. Because, of course, they could not accept that Jesus would suffer and would die. Now, mind you, my dear brothers and sisters, remember that the disciples, when Jesus called them, they left practically everything behind. They left their father, they left their boat, they left their, their nets, they left everything behind just to follow the Lord. And aside from that, remember that during that time, Jesus is like, quote-unquote, hated by everyone. If you are during the time of Jesus, will you be siding, going with a person who is hated by everyone? We avoid those people. We don't ally with those people. And yet the disciples left everything behind, and in spite of the fact that everybody, quote-unquote, hated Jesus, they still went and followed Jesus. We can only think of one reason why they did. That they were willing to take the risk of being hated also by everyone. And what's the possible reason? Because, of course, they considered Jesus to be the Messiah, to be the Savior. In short, to be a powerful king. And all of a sudden, he says, I would suffer and he, I would die. I can just imagine the feeling of the disciples during the time following Jesus, literally walking, following Jesus, and hearing Jesus say that he would suffer and he would die. I could imagine them saying, why did we follow this man? Why are we taking the risk of even being hated by everyone else because he's hated by everyone else? Why would we do that when in fact... He would suffer and he would die. He is not the kind of Messiah we are expecting. In fact, they could have said, he is not the Messiah. Why? Because, of course, that's not the kind of Messiah they were waiting for. That's why I would say that at that, that point, it was, in a way, necessary for Jesus to go up the mountain and be transfigured before them. Now, remember that in the life of Jesus... Every time he's faced with a lot of difficulties, great difficulties, when he has to make major decisions in life, okay, he would always go up the mountain. Because the mountain in the scriptures is always the place of encounter between God and man. In short, Jesus will always have to talk to the Father every time he is faced with difficulties, he has to make decisions. That's why personally, my dear brothers and sisters, for Jesus... It was in a way also necessary for him to go up the mountain. Why? Because he was already on the way to Jerusalem. He knows that he would suffer and die in Jerusalem. Jesus must have thought, I have to go up and talk to the Father and ask him, is this really your will? Should I really go to Jerusalem in order to suffer and to die? That's why for Jesus, when he was transfigured, and the Gospel of St. Mark and all the other two versions would say that there was a voice coming from the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. It's like a confirmation that indeed it is the will of the Father. 
with Moses and Elijah appearing with Jesus, it's like confirmation from the prophets, of course, represented, of course, by Elijah, the prophet, and Moses, of course, the lawgiver. Remember the Ten Commandments? According to the law and according to the prophets, it is really the will of the Father. That's why after transfiguration, Jesus will walk towards Jerusalem, even though he knows it's a place he would suffer and he would die. For the disciples, for Jesus to be transfigured before them is a foretaste of what's the end. It's like if I'm Jesus, I must be telling my disciples, I know how you feel. I'm sure you're disappointed, you're depressed, and perhaps you're thinking twice, should I still follow this man? Should I still follow this Jesus? You actually would suffer and die. He himself says it. Shall I just go back to my family? But for Jesus to be transfigured before them, it is a foretaste of what's the end. It's like telling these three disciples, Jesus saying, the passion and death is not the end of my life. The end is a glorious event, being transfigured, remember, in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of the Father. No wonder, my dear brothers and sisters, when they went down the mountain, they went straight to Jerusalem. For Jesus, he has confirmed, the Father has confirmed, Moses has confirmed, Elijah has confirmed, it is really the will of the Father. That's why he will walk towards Jerusalem. For the disciples, having seen the foretaste of what will be the end, the disciples will now follow Jesus to the cross, to Calvary. In this season of Lent, as I said at the beginning, on the second Sunday of Lent, it's always the transfiguration of the Lord. Because as we reflect on the passion and death of the Lord, the church reminds us that the end is not the passion and death, that the end is the glorious event in the kingdom of heaven. And the foretaste is the transfiguration of the Lord. Now, what does that mean in our life? Now, at present, my dear brothers and sisters, to follow the Lord just like the disciples, there will be a lot of difficulties. There will be a lot of challenges. Like the disciples, when Jesus, after Jesus says, I would suffer and I would die, in that Gospel of St. Mark, after that, Jesus tells his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple will have to take up his cross and follow me. And yet those who take up the cross and follow the Lord will at the end be transfigured also. You will be transfigured in the kingdom of heaven. Again to the question, what does it mean in our life now? My dear brothers and sisters, if you follow the will of the Lord, do not expect it will be an easy life. Because when you follow the Lord, there will be a lot of difficulties, challenges, and temptations that will come your way. In fact, some would say, when you follow the will of the Lord and there are many difficulties and problems that come your way, it can be a sign that you're really doing the will of God. Some would say, if you've been living a comfortable life, a very comfortable life, no challenges at all, especially for us priests, perhaps it's good to ask ourselves, it's, is it still the will of God I'm following? <laughs> because to follow the will of the Lord, there will really be a lot of difficulties. And yet, my dear brothers and sisters, only those who are willing to follow the Lord on his walk to Calvary, on his passion and death, who would be willing to accept the cross even though it's heavy and difficult to carry, those who will persevere at the end, until the end, will also rise with him, will also be transfigured. Let us pray. Loving Father, thank you for giving us your only begotten Son to be our Savior. We ask you, loving Father, that as we follow him and many challenges come our way, May you give us strength to follow the Lord. May we always have the inspiration in the midst of the many difficulties that come our way. May we remain faithful to you so that at the end, we will also be transfigured with your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday, everyone, and God bless you. Thank you for partaking of the Word of God, the food for our souls, and being part of spreading the good news and nourishing others. May God bless and protect you.